cantankerous relationship. He was the most difficult close friend of my life. And I was no prince myself, you know. I was, uh, you know, I carried guns all the time and, uh, you know, the, the whole Vietnam thing was uh, the, the, sort of across the bear. So it's not like we had a perfect friendship, but we, when it, we had this, I mean, we, but we were. In the deepest level, if, if Ed wanted one person to come and get him in the desert, it'd be, it was Doug Peacock, you know, and that's, that's, you know, no one else could find him, no one else would do that. And perhaps for the same reason, he entrusted his, the place where he's going to be buried and his burial to me, too. And, uh, uh, but it, uh, you know, the fact that I loved Ed and always had, you know, I, I think I waited until four days before his death before I finally told him. What did you tell him? I just, that, that, that I loved him, always had. For someone who didn't know Ed Abbey, mm -hmm. tell us who he was. <laughs> well, he was one of the funniest writers I ever read, and I've read my share of literature, but uh, uh, Ed was, uh, oh, I mean, he was, he, he was a drunk, he was a lecher, he, he was all, all of those things, and but he cared so deeply, and he saw through the of human society so easily. There's no one he didn't offend with his criticism. No one escaped him, you know, knee-jerk liberals, you name it, up and down, political spectrum. And, you know, he saw right off, you know, he, he, the value of wilderness. He said he, he thinks maybe the only thing worth saving, and he's talking about the world, is wilderness. That's what he came to conclude in his last years. And, uh, you know, for a lot of different reasons, uh, I, I've, I've always believed that, and that was our shared value. And the, the fight for that is what bonded us together forever. I mean, we also raised children together. You know, my first and one of his last batches, you know, were, were really good friends. We all grew up together, camped out, you know. We'd go take all the kids out trick-or-treating on Halloween, and there'd be Ed, you know, falling slowly behind with our, you know, drinking beer with the pistols under the seat of the pickup. <laughs> uh, what was the Monkey Wrench Gang? Well, the Monkey Wrench Gang was uh, something Ed made up. He just kind of took, he, he modeled a few of his characters on his friends. And, uh, um, you know, what he, he had hoped to inspire through that book. He, he wanted to inspire you know, spontaneous, countless cells to kind of grow up all over the place and take up the real work of monkey wrenching. And, um, um, but, you know, that, that it was, it was a, a, a very funny, talented work of fiction. You knew the people who founded Earth First. You mm -hmm. didn't exactly found it. No, them, no. But... They were younger than I was. And what did you think of their tactics, and what were the tactics? Well, their tactics were, you know, uh, no compromise in defense of Mother Earth. And I thought they were right on. I supported them all the way. Um, you know, their, uh, their tactics uh, advocated uh, militant, you know, defense of the wilderness, including, you know, sabotaging bulldozers and spiking trees and all of that kind of stuff. But they change from that, they, when it would kill people. Uh, there was never, violence towards another human being or even a living thing was uh, never part of Ed Abbey's vision or part of the Monkey Wrench Gang in, 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 a, in a large kind of metaphorical way. I mean, Earth First lifted its, you know, lifted its mandate right out of the page of the Monkey Wrench Gang. But that's not, that's not part of it. You, um, you experienced an FBI infiltrator. You met someone. Talk about that experience and why that guy was out there. Well, um, Earth, uh, the, yeah. Um, you know, Earth First was strikingly effective in broadening the dialogue of you know, wilderness and, and uh, wildness and protection of, you know, natural areas and animals. And many by advocating this position the way over here. I mean, you had the Sierra Club saying, oh, you can't do that. 
But I mean, once Earth first got in there, the, 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 the dialogue about the value of wilderness really was, they were strikingly effective. And I think because of that, you know, the, F, they, the FBI went after them, you know, undercover. And, uh, you know, uh, there was mainly, uh, the, the big bust was uh, based on uh, a, a little group or cell up by Prescott, Arizona, who were, uh, and, and that's three or four people who were infiltrated by a uh, FBI agent that went by the name of Fain, who pretended to be a Vietnam vet and uh, formed really personal relationships with these people and totally betrayed them. You know, basically let them out in the field and all of a sudden, you know, with all their, they were going to go after power line station or something and, you know, all of a sudden he disappeared, helicopters came in and busted these people. Well, the next morning, the FBI uh, busted Dave Foreman down in Tucson and they were also at my door. The FBI came to my door. Now, I was totally unimportant in, you know, the workings of Earth First, but the, nonetheless they were there. I was gone. They terrified the 14-year-old gardener that had been hired to water the plants and, uh, I didn't come in, you know, I kind of stayed out there for a while. Once the LA Times reported that I was responsible for getting Jerry Spence um, involved uh, in the pro bono defense of Dave Foreman, which is totally untrue, but Jerry Spence is and became a very good friend of mine and he offered it, you know, he said, you know, if they come after you, just tell them to call your lawyer in Wyoming. Once that was public knowledge, the feds really never came after me again. You had um, a close encounter with Fane. Uh, you went out for drinks. Oh, with him. yeah. Um, he, uh, this was two weeks before Ed Abbey died. For, uh, you know, I, I don't believe the FBI would have busted her at first until Ed was dead. He was that much of a presence in all of this. But nonetheless, uh, Ed gave a last reading on March 3rd. What, what was it? Is it 1989? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he died like less than two weeks later. But, uh, you know, I was there. I knew it was the last public reading anybody would ever hear from Ed Abbey. And I had his little girl, uh, I, I had uh, I had his little girl on my shoulders as we were watching her dad. And I was very distracted. Well, after this, uh, an introduction was made by a mutual friend. And this guy, the FBI agent, Fane, uh, we went out to have a couple of beers and he tried to uh, I understand there was a helicopter taping the conversation, but he pretended to be a Vietnam vet, and I could tell almost immediately he was lying. You know, there's a lot of, it's, you can tell pretty easily, and I didn't give him much information. So. But I wasn't important in all of that, not really. Those last days of Ed Abbey. Well, I wrote a book about him, and, uh, you know, not just his last days, but, uh, you know, he was bleeding from esophageal varices, and, you know, he uh, didn't want to die in the hospital, didn't want to die with all those tubes in him. That was the worst thing. And so we, it was in and out of hospitals, and he d it took about a week for him to actually die. And uh, at one point in the hospital, he pulled out all the tubes and announced the clearest eyes I'd ever seen. It, it was time to go, you know. So we took him out in the desert. I picked a place close by because it looked like, because Clark came back, to my pickup and I said, he's going fast. So we took him out to this place uh, to die. And uh, and it wasn't too far from Tucson, but it's a nice place. And I used to camp out there myself a little bit and build a little fire. And Ed sat in a chair for a while and for you know, 20 minutes. And then he decided it was you know, time for him to die. And uh, he got in a sleeping bag. Clark got in there with him. That's his wife. And uh, you know, we waited and we waited. We all went over and said goodbye, Ed. And, that, that kind of thing. A couple hours later, you know, it was just getting daylight and I went over and he, he looked at me and he said, sometimes the magic doesn't work. <laughs> he died a couple days later, but yeah. Any last thoughts on Ed 20 years later on this 20th anniversary? Yeah, I, my thoughts are that uh, I thought there'd be a hundred Ed Abbey's by now that somebody would come and Fill those great big toothy lecherous boots, you know, but for whatever reason they haven't, and I think uh, our world has never needed an Ed Abbey more than today. Doug Peacock, naturalist, adventurer, writer, 
Among his books, Walking It Off, a veteran's chronicle of war and wilderness, and In the Presence of Grizzlies, the ancient bond between men and bears, written with his wife, Andrea Peacock. Uh, he is the character Hey Duke in Ed Abbey's The Monkey Wrench Gang. Special thanks to Montana PBS and Bozeman that hosted us there when we were on our community media, community voices tour. And that does it for our broadcast. If you'd like to get a copy of the show, you can go to our website at democracynow.org. Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Berkshire, Fadal Kadus, Aaron Monte, Angeli Comet, Steve Martinez, Nicole Salazar, Hani Massoud, Robbie Karen, Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Nagara, Peter Curries, our engineers. Special thanks also to Becca Staley, Nick Gilla, Angie Kiefer, Samantha Shumbly, Jessel Noor, John Randolph, Jose Miranda, Laura Chipley, Travis Collins, Kieran Krug Meadows, Rock Hemp, Penny Vesta Godars. On Saturday, I'll be at the Green Festival in Chicago at the Convention Center. Check our website, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.